In the TIPBS podcast, you get great ideas and practical advice for educators. You can get more invaluable insights and free resources by subscribing to the TIPBS monthly newsletter. Visit www.tipbs.com and register your email address. Hello and welcome to the TIPBS podcast. I am your host, Dr. Kay Eyre. In this special episode, we share with you a teacher coaching call with one of the participants of the TIPBS program. The call follows a structured inquiry process that aims to work collaboratively with teachers to generate ideas for interventions and strategies. To protect the identity of the caller and the student, we have changed their names. If by chance you were to recognize the caller, we request that you pre- please act with professional courtesy to protect the confidentiality of the information discussed. As always, I am joined in the call by my colleague, Dr. Gavin Krishnamurthy, who facilitates the process. We hope you find this call interesting and useful. I'm your host, Dr. Gavin Krishnamurthy. Uh, I'm joined as always by Dr. K. Eyre. Hi, Kay. Hello, how are you? Good, thanks. Um, So today we're doing a consult call and on the line we have Sue. Hi, Sue. Hello. Hello, Gavin. Hello, Kay. Hi. Um, So so we're here to talk about a specific student that you had in mind. So we'll get right into it. So did you want to tell us a little bit about your role and the kind of setting you're working in, the school setting you're working in, um, and then we'll start talking about the um, young man that you had in mind for tonight. Okay. Yes, I'm the special ed teacher at a mainstream school in Darwin, and the young boy, James, is in a year one class. Uh, he came to our school at the end of last year um, after intermittent um, days at school, plus we were his, about his seventh school. Um, what we know, he's had a very traumatic past. He is um, at our school and things have settled. He's been foster cared by his um, non-biological grandmother. His father has never been on the scene. His mother's in jail. His stepfather's in jail. And life's really difficult for this young man, it seems. And what he's showing us is um, intermittent crying during the day for no apparent reason and inability to explain why he is crying. Mm-hmm. So have I gone too far? Mm-hmm. No, you're right. No, 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 you're right. You're all good. Yes, you're right. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, just to clarify, so you're a special ed teacher in a mainstream school. Um, So does that mean, um, Sue, that you sort of, do you hold a class or do you kind of just um, go into kind of classes that need sort of extra support? What would your role actually look like? It is going into classes that need extra support in mm-hmm. observation role, in writing behaviour support plans, educational adjustment plans, um, moral support for teachers, yep. so anything that's needed. Um, so I'm not attached to one particular class but throughout the whole school. We've got about 600 students in the school. Yep. I, I don't get to work one-on-one often with the students as far as following through OT or speech programs. But um, I do go in and observe and offer advice, speak to parents about um, with the teachers about their, their children. Yeah. So at the moment, that's what, where my role is. Mm. And you have a teaching background, do you, Sue? Yes, I've yep. been teaching for about 20 years in oh. uh, Indigenous, remote and mainstream schools. Yeah, great. Um, okay. Did you have any questions for Sue Kay? No, not no, not at the moment. Thank you. So um so it was James that you just started talking about. He's in year one, so he's five, is that right? Yes. Yep. Um so and he's No, started... he's he's six. He's just turned seven. He repeated oh, yeah. uh he repeated transition, which is our first year of formal schooling. 
And um, so this is his, yeah, third year at formal schooling. So okay. he's a bit older than the others, hey? That's right. And he is a bit bigger in stature than the others as well. So he, he does stand out a bit. Uh-huh. Okay. And... Um, Sorry, I was just interrupting. I don't, I don't know. I'm just getting some feedback. I, I don't know if that's from UK or... Um, I'll mute my mic, hey? Oh. Okay, thank you. I can still hear it, but that's okay. Um, so he's big in stature, so he's repeated, so he's about seven years old. Um, and what, it seemed, what yeah. you're sort of um, observing at the moment is that there's a bit of crying during the day, unable to explain himself. Was there any other sort of behaviours you're seeing at the moment, Sue? Uh, fearful of being removed from the class, for example, going into uh, reading groups or going into our intervention room, which is a really nice like padded room with swings and great activities, and he is allowed to ask for a break and come over any time he wants, but he will not remove himself. He doesn't like going to the office for uh, stickers or praise or rewards. He really likes to stay within his room. Mm -hmm. He, um, what else? So we can't pick the trigger for his um, meltdowns, his crying, mm -hmm. and he, they escalated a couple of weeks ago and we, we think it coincided with the fact that he saw his stepmother, no, his mother, slash the tyres on his stepfather's car mm -hmm. and his behaviour heightened. So heightened meant that he started kicking chairs over, mm -hmm. telling his teacher that she's not the boss, um, mm -hmm. pushing tables into doors and mm -hmm. he um, scaled the fence and got out of um, the back of the classroom area. Right. So we noticed that um, and his behaviours have settled again because we've put a support teacher in there as well, a teacher assistant. Mm -hmm. So she she shadows him. We've also just started a working for program, the visual timetable, mm -hmm. and he seems to be doing quite well with, with that structure and that support to date. Mm -hmm. So but it's possible that these meltdowns will happen again um, and it could it, they could happen after lunch, after he's played soccer with his little friends or mm -hmm. it could happen when he doesn't want to do a piece of work mm -hmm. or if he was, if he, for example, an OT was to come and see him last Friday, she cancelled, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I was scanning my brain, how am I going to remove him from the assembly area without him, it being a screaming match to get him to see the OT. So that's yes. his behaviours that we see so far. And is that your dilemma at the moment? Because it sounds like there's been a couple of things put in place, the teacher support, some visual um, timetable stuff, and that's sort of working. Mm -hmm. So is your dilemma at the mm -hmm. moment about kind of transitioning him to new kind of uh, environments within the school? Is that what you find most challenging? Or what, do you say, what would you say is the most kind of difficult? situation mm, yeah he's getting better at transitioning to other places um mm. working independently if he didn't have his ta with him mm. he would um yeah he'd get lost within the class and his behaviors would heighten he would um, not work he would uh, probably throw tantrums in the middle of the room cry mm. he won't remove himself to the corner of the classroom that's got a nice soft bean bag mm -hmm. that we've set up for him. It's got a soccer bean bag there. Mm -hmm. uh, he won't take a break, although he now takes a drink break. He'll go out of the classroom mm -hmm. to get a drink and come back. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm not too concerned about his academics. Yeah. Um, he's capable of the work, mm -hmm. but actually completing it and complying with instructions and transitions and movements, yeah, that's the most difficult thing, yeah, okay. I would say. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, and I usually ask it this a bit later, but I might ask this now. If there was one thing that you would want to kind of want to focus on with him, like if you were to kind of prioritise a little bit in terms of 
what you want to actually focus on. And if you could focus on one kind of observable thing with him amongst kind of complying um, with the instructions, that type of thing, what would that be, do you think, if it's like a one small change that you would like to make with him soon? We uh, think that getting him to recognise and then express mm. how he's feeling would be a really good thing because we can't get him to um, to recognise when he's escalating mm. or even he, it's difficult for him to say uh, when he's when he's happy or when it's okay mm. or when he's he's cons- when he's crying and upset he mm. he I don't know whether he cognitively can't work it out or he yeah. can't say those things and we tried during happy times like it was his birthday last week and he was pretty happy about mm. that. Mm. And so we were really revving it up and, you know, mm. saying it's so exciting and what are you getting for your birthday, da, 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 da. Mm. And he wouldn't, he hardly cracked a smile and wouldn't mm. say mm. that he's looking forward to or he's happy. So if we could help him recognise his emotions mm. and express that, we could possibly help him to then regulate. Mm. I think that would be something that we would want like to do. Yeah, great. All right, we can talk about that. So, I might just, um, Kai, did you have any questions just before we jump into some of his background? Um, just the support teacher that's in his classroom at the moment. I'm assuming that mm-hmm. is a long, is a short term intervention, <laughs> given the resources that that would take. Is that that's got a short life? Correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. So, it, to the end of this term, it was, which yep. is next week for us. But I think it's going to continue next semester, and we're very much well. The the powers that be say, you know, he you're not there just for him. You know, he can't become attached to you, as per se. Yeah. Uh, you know. So we've just got to establish establish. So. We're going to establish his working for program and uh, that's only been going for a week and a half now and it's working well with his visual timetable. So we're going to keep that going and seeing how, you know, whether she can pull away from him a bit more. Is she in there every day, Sue? Yes, she's in there every day. All yes. day? Um, he goes to a reading intervention, so that's... 40 minutes out and then in the afternoon she goes to another group but another TA comes in generally for the class. So there's another adult in the room. Okay, it all yeah, pretty much all the time. Okay, thanks. Great. All right. So we might just jump in just to get some context to some of James's behaviour. I think you started talking about yes. it there. So, so what do we know about his family? Do you know much about who's in the family and what's happening at the moment? Um, so he was uh, quite abused by his mother when he was very young. I'm thinking one year old. Mm-hmm. He was beaten up by her. Mm-hmm. Um, she left him on the roadside uh, in a, a town, you know, three hours south of here and drove off. Um, he's had surgery on his face to repair some of the damage. He is in foster care. He has been in foster care, but now because of the stolen generation issues, mm. uh, the courts try to put the children with Indigenous, he's part Indigenous, um, with Indigenous families. So he's with his sibling's grandma, right. but he's, She's not his biological grandma, but because he's got two younger siblings, the three of them are with this elderly grandma who is really um, old and frail and she's doing her best. She has custody of them, care for them for 12 months, which is another 10 months of care. Um, His stepfather that he does see or used to see is just has just returned to jail. He's um, addicted to ice. Mm-hmm. His biological mother is or has also recently been been returned to jail, mm-hmm. and that's all I know okay. so far. Um, yep. And so, just the um, two siblings he's living with. How old were they? Do you know, Sue? 
I think about about three, and the youngest is about eleven months. Eleven months, okay, very little, okay. Yeah. Um, and do you know how old Grandma is at all? Is she in her eighties or? Oh, look. Oh, no, very I, she, she looks. She looks about eighty, but no, I think it's about. She'd be sixty. She's still of working age, and and She's she goes back working. to work for a rest. She reckons. Yeah. Right, right, right. And puts yeah. the kids in. Yeah, she puts the kids in daycare, uh, you know, daycare and after school care. Yeah, right. Okay, all right. Mm, yeah. That's a sad, sad story, really, isn't it? That sounds like he's yeah, a very scared, scared little boy. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm kind of thinking about even that little story you told before, so of, you know, his behaviour escalating when he saw mum slashing dad's tyres. Is that is that the story? Was that the biological mother? Yes, the biological mother was. She moved into the neighbourhood. Mm, she's mm. not allowed to have contact with with any of the children, mm, but she mm. was in the vicinity, and mm. um, he must have been at the stepfather's house. Mm. And um, she came by and was um, and slashed his tyres, and then right. took off. And he he viewed this. Okay. Mm. All right. Um. And with. The surgery on the face was that because of an injury yeah. stand? Uh, and do do we know much about the incident that led to that injury? No, I don't. I've I've okay. spoken to the the step grandmother, and she mm. just said that the the police at, at, that attended at the time said mm. that um, it was one of the most horrific beatings that mm. they had ever seen on an infant. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's just you can just see the scar between his nose and lip. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Little fella. Okay. So, Kay, did you have any questions that you wanted to ask us about that historical context? No, not really, other than it's yeah. a picture painted in horrible trauma, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, poor thing. Mm. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, mm. okay. So, so what we might sort of do is, uh, I know you've kind of narrated a couple of incidences already, um, just in terms mm -hmm. of a recent incident, if you could just talk us through just as a bit of an example of what like a typical kind of incident with him might look like. Was there one that happened quite recently that you can kind of talk through sort of, you know, that you were privy to sort of from the beginning to kind of how it all kind of ended. Was there one that comes to your mind? So is this one when his behaviour escalates? Yeah, yeah. And something that you were sort of privy to that you could you could have kind of seen, not just when it was really bad, but something that you sort of saw from the beginning to sort of how it resolved, perhaps when you were in the classroom when it happened. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was in the class. I I came into the classroom one day. The teacher okay. called me, and yeah. he was refusing to to do some maths maths yeah. activities. And we were sitting on the children were sitting on the floor, and yeah. he was walking around the room, refusing to do it, crying. Yeah. Um, and what was he crying about? And then he came and. Uh, not sure. Okay. And what time could, was it? It could, was could have, have, this would have been before recess time, so, you know, Thanks. half past yeah. nine, ten o'clock. Correct. Yeah. So he then came, I, I came and sat down on the floor next to some other children hmm. and then he came over and his, because I was sitting next to his best friend and then I, the teacher said, oh, well, let's, Let's start playing this little math game. So mm. I said, okay. And so I said, oh, I'll be your partner to his best friend. And he came over, James came over and wanted to see what we were doing. And we started playing and I invited James in and said, hey, do you want to play with us too? Mm. So he joined in mm. and he stopped crying. Mm. He played and lo and behold, he won. I didn't make him win. He won. <laughs> and he was very happy. And so we played the game again mm. and then he was quite content and but time was up and then I think it became to recess time or something. So mm. he had settled a little bit mm. and it was time to go and play outside. Mm. So that was a positive one, that one. Yeah. Mm. 
<laughs> Great. All right. That's quite a good one, actually. I think we should actually remember mm. to do that, to think of positive ones as well. Um, mm. So um, what we might do is we might just jump in to try and think a little bit about um, why um, James is actually having these troubles um, managing his feelings. I guess what we're focusing in on is this idea of helping him recognize his emotions and communicate it to others um, before he's actually mm -hmm. really distressed. What were your thoughts, Sue? Uh, it sounds like you've done a bit of work with him. What, what were your thoughts about why at this time he's having such trouble with his feelings and um, being able to participate in class? Uh, so just speaking from a teacher's point of view, I don't yeah. have any special ed education or... or um, from just knowledge I've gathered, I would say that he comes to school with a heightened sense of anxiety. Um, mm. He's protective and he's concerned about his welfare. Mm. And any little thing that he perceives to be um, threatening, so for him threatening might be a task that's too, he perceives as too difficult. Mm. Uh, this is too hard for me. I can't do yeah. this. Yeah. I won't be able to do it. I won't be successful. Mm. And then the meltdown happens. Yeah. Um that's that's what I think. Um yeah. and I I think maybe why the visual timetable and the working towards mm. works mm. is because it's predictable mm. and um it's using oh um no, it's predictable and he gets a reward at the end, which is like the little carrot, but mm -hmm. um, it's working at the moment. And he, mm -hmm. he goes to a little reading intervention group and he wouldn't even leave the classroom to go to that. Yeah, but yeah. now he will, he will, That's and great. he goes into there and it's very structured. Yeah. You know, they have um, a reading, they read a book, they answer some questions, they go on the computer and that happens every single time. Yeah. And he's just, he does really well in that. The structure of it, the predictability, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. now the knowledge that he knows he can do it. Yeah. So, and small group, and small group too, I think. Yeah. I think in a classroom that he's in a very stimulating classroom, the teacher's very mm. more inquiry learning. Mm. She's got mm. uh, things hanging everywhere and mm. Mm. Uh, little bowls with water and things in to investigate. And mm. there's a lot around him. Maybe that. Uh, upset him, um, mm. you know, overstimulates him. Yeah, I'm just yeah. guessing. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. And that's really great, I think. And you probably understand that context really well. And I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head with a few different things about him being anxious and feeling threatened. I think that's absolutely it. But I'll give Kay a go at having some thoughts. Kay, mm -hmm. what were your thoughts about um, what was happening for James at the moment and why he was so dysregulated in class? Um, I think sometimes, yeah, we try, we sometimes <laughs> try and do too much when, like Sue said, um, he probably needs everything to be very simple and black and white and the same. Mm. You know, it's, I, speaking from my own early childhood classroom, I've been um, very guilty as charged of having a room <laughs> that was so busy that that was mm. fine for the majority of children, but for others it was just mm. all too much and it increased their anxiety because there was so much choice, so much left up to the child to decide, you know, too much guidance and not enough mm. direction. Um, uh, and I used to find, especially um, with the... Um, young boys in our intervention centre who were, you know, um, sort of older versions of James that in my mind the activities that I was giving them were quite contrary to what I believed because they were very structured, boring type worksheet activities mm, and mm. everything that we did was there was no room for for choice or well, not so much not choice but no no nothing creative or um i don't know busy about it. it was no it was just yeah. they just had a wonderful 
it was the security, I think, for them that somebody had taken, somebody was very predictable, the activity was super predictable, it was really clear, clean, and they knew exactly what the expectation was. There was absolutely yeah. nothing left to chance. And from a most teachers, especially in early childhood, a very constructiveness, constructive and exploratory in the way they they, you know, mm. do their instruction. And and I think it's really important to remember that differentiation for people like James often means that we're doing what is probably contrary to what we think is the right thing to be doing for him when in fact it's absolutely the right thing where it's really super predictable and very basic and I guess what we would class as quite boring because mm, mm. that gives them a yep. real sense of security I think yeah yeah, and, and I am oh, maybe guilty as charged too because I love the exciting classroom with things to explore and and being creative and making and doing. And, mm. but, and it's, yeah, too, it's yeah. like, you know, I know I've said, I've told this story before, but it's, it's like the first time, you know, Govindin um, mentioned, mentioned to teachers, including myself, that, well, imagine what it's like to be hyper vigilant all the time when you've got stuff happening behind you this child needs to be mm, with mm. his back against the wall really so that he he's got everything in front of him so he can see what's going on and i just think mm. if you're in the middle of super busyness when you're hyper vigilant and terrified for your own well-being it must be so such an anxiety filled situation to be and you wouldn't know mm. what emotions were happening you'd be so confused we'd have so much mm. stuff going on you know whereas yeah i just think mm, it's um yeah i think we just need to especially us as we've both said so guilty is charged especially in early childhood because we tend to go um, over the top more than others normally, um, yeah, in our approach. Mm. Yes, I'm thinking now. <laughs> uh. Yeah, and it does seem like he is responding. So he's 40 minutes with this small group of predictable reading intervention that he goes to and now the predictable... Um, daily um, the visual timetable he's got in the working for program so maybe yeah. that maybe that is what's working at the moment and but, in a smaller um, group he knows exactly who's in his group there's no surprises there's nobody moving around coming mm. in and out of his physical space he knows exactly mm. what's going on in the space that he's got I think the key word there that we've been talking about is safety for this boy. I mean, in its very kind of raw state, when we think about things like PTSD and trauma, um, children develop it because they think they're going to die, um, essentially. They been be, they go through, you know, these experiences that, are, you know, severely compromise their safety. And I don't know how old he was when he, was, when he had that happen, um, but essentially, the you know the, the body you know basically gets programmed to be really vigilant of the environment around him, um, and yep. if it's happened really early on, you know it'd be very hard for him to actually know and explain why he's upset about things because it's often that the body and you know emotions kind of take over way before any of his kind of conscious thinking comes online to be able to make sense of all that. Oh, and what we know is for that stuff to settle down, safety and predictability and having things black and white and having things non-stimulating, a bit like what Kai's saying and you, saying and you were saying as well, is, is really, really important for him. I mean, he's a complex little boy with lots of other things happening um, for him. But I, I wanted to leave you, like, perhaps with, with a bit of a framework so that just to kind of get... I think some of your thinking and strategies, just putting them into boxes maybe perhaps and just mm -hmm. even starting to think about his capacity to develop and recognize feelings developmentally a little bit, you know, that that it's not 
sort of just going to happen overnight, but that it's like a skill, like anything that you develop over time. And um, it's, a, it's like a five-stage model, and it's, it's about kind of emotion regulation. So, you know, right up the top, our goal is for this little boy is to be able to self-regulate, basically, you know, that he can catch yeah. himself when he's really upset, um, be able to go and tell someone about it, or even just be able to do it for himself, where he can calm himself yeah. down and self-regulate is what we want to do. Right down the other bottom of the other end of the spectrum is what we do when kids cannot do that at all, um, which is what we call yeah. auto-regulation, which is essentially um, what we do with um, really little babies, basically, which is, um, you know, we have, you know, routines and rituals and things daily that are, that are predictable and happen at a set time in a set way so that the biology kind of learns these sort of very predictable things and he doesn't feel threatened and it gives him some sense of mastery over his kind of world, um, which is a bit what Kay is saying, I think, is, you know, having very, you know, having the visual timetables, having kind of predictable routines, that's sort of auto-regulation stuff. And it, it, we all do it, you know, how we, mm. you know, we all have our coffees, we all <laughs> have our little morning rituals and, you know, things that wake us up. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's about having those sort of routines and rituals for him, um, which is incredibly mm -hmm. important, I think. Um, did you have any thoughts about that, Sue, about those sort of routines and rituals? I think you've spoken about that already a bit. Um, I just want to take a step back. Do you think if this is a realistic goal for us to have of him? If not, do you think he's ready for it? Do you think this is what we need to be encouraging him to do? Yeah, I, I think it, I'll be interested to hear what Kaya has to say about it too, but I think it is a very important kind of uh, you know, aspect of his social emotional learning. So essentially it's what you were mm -hmm. saying before is we need to kind of pull back and look at the foundations of what kind of is going to be achieved for academic stuff, which is kind of him being able to stay calm enough, safe enough in the classroom without wanting to leave essentially. Um, and to be able mm. to do that, we've got to kind of meet him where he's at essentially. So if, if he's come in and he's, you know, just seeing mum slash the tires of dad or whatnot, then we know that we're right down mm. the bottom. We need our kind of routines and rituals and all of that stuff. Because from auto-regulation, the next level up is what we call external regulation, which is essentially what we do when a little child's upset. You know, we pick him up, we pat him, um, you know, we, we're there to kind of soothe them somehow. And for kids who are slightly older, that might be kind of removing themselves from the situation, having a little space for themselves, just so that just enough so that they can tolerate someone coming into their space, someone that they trust to be able to soothe them. But I, I definitely think it's a reasonable kind of goal to kind of have, but it's just about having yeah. realistic kind of expectations of it. Does that sort of make sense in terms mm. of how much you can do it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, did you no, want to that's add that? No, my... Sorry, um, Sue, I cut you off. That's okay. No, no, I'm keen to hear what Kay has to say. I don't know if she can hear. Yes, I am. I'm here. I was just listening. I was thinking, Sue, you were going to keep talking, give in and ask something else that's why I was quiet um no you're right does I just have does the teacher um do any um little activities about feelings as part of her sort of daily she routines I'm sure she would yes she is yeah she has uh she's got, you know, like whole class things um but we, well, I mean, we could do more. And the uh, the deputy principal has suggested that my very experienced CESO, the student support officer, take him for half hour sessions two or three times a week. Where and and we're going to be looking at um, his social emotional well being and looking at one on one, you know, uh, pictures of children in different emotions and recognizing naming them and recognizing them and and doing things like that. So that's coming on soon. Um, the teacher does occasionally or will read a book that has feelings as its major theme. Mm. 
Mm. Um, and we've thought about having, I used to be, um, did the tribes program. Do you know that social and emotional wellbeing program? Getting part of it is getting a whole class in tune with recognizing your emotions and right. you can tap on a particular word or a particular image of yep. a smiley face or a happy, yep. you know. So I used to get my, my class to do that and she was thinking of doing that. So she said all the kids could benefit from that. Just, um, Briefly, coming back in from play, how am I feeling now? Yep, slap on the happy face, I'm feeling happy. Slap yep. on the sad face because I had a disagreement at recess or whatever. So we were also thinking of that, so it's a whole class thing. But at the moment, her class is like it could be a case study and there are lots of kids with different needs in there. Mm. So we didn't we didn't want to overload her with more. She's got two with ADHD, she's got um, James and yeah. she's got one with cognitive, uh, low cognitive and da da da. So we haven't tried to put too much on no, her no, other no. than um, routine. Mm. No, that's fine. I just wondered if she was already exactly as you said. I mean, a lot of teachers when as a settling activity when kids come in from what we would call our big play lunch, our big lunch, our long mm -hmm. lunch break mm -hmm. where they run around a lot, um, routinely you would come in and you would have, you know, um, we used to, uh, my classroom, we used to call it talk time Teddy where we would talk about our feelings and our play time and, um, with Teddy. Um, I wondered... Speaking of that, does James have a um, – does he have an object that is special for him of any description? Well, he has. He's had a teddy um, and he, you know, take it or leave it, you know, one day it's his, you know, he can't yeah, be no, separated from know. it the next Sometimes day. Sometimes they have like a little Lego man or, a, you know, something that they can yeah. have in their pocket or whatever. I just didn't know if he already had, I mean, little, sometimes little things like that are sometimes um, helpful in making them feel secure. But I didn't know if he sure. was that type of child or that was something that he already had or. Um, uh, my, and he has fiddle toys as such, you know, for in his hands, like um, some of that sticky dough or just little rubbery things. But they seem to, I, in my opinion, they don't get used correctly in the class because no. all the other kids want them yeah. and, you know, it just becomes bigger than Ben Hur, you know, yeah. who's mm. got who and, and those silly, you know, yeah. thinner the, things that they've got mm, at the moment. So I was just going to ask you, the going with the um, student support officer to have – well, that, that's a one-on-one -on -one session, is it, with her about feelings? Yes, yes, one, and, maximum two. And he I gets think. on well yeah. with her? Like, has he got a re good relationship with her? See, he hasn't at the moment. See, we've right. been using her for the existing kids. She's, had a, she's got a full um, timetable with existing kids, but um, the, the deputies asked if she will drop some of the other kids who have developed well enough in their program and to take him on as well. Mm. So she's going to start that next semester, which will be term three. Yeah. yeah, I just wondered how he'd go when you said that he was hesitant to leave his space and he'd only just got comfortable with his reading group, how he'd, mm. go, how he'd go leaving or whether she would need to sort of spend some time in with his reading group just so that he was familiar with her before she became another person for him to try and mm. work out and build a bit of trust with. I think that's, yeah. de that's definitely probably the way to go. I mean, you know, after we think about auto-regulation, external regulation, the next one is what we call core regulation, Sue, which is basically, you know, kids just talking to someone that they trust about what's wrong, you know. So if he's walking in the room just crying, is there somebody who can actually kind of just pull them aside and go, what's the matter, mate? You know, you know, what's upsetting you? Let's just talk about it for a couple of minutes. And he's not going to open up to just anybody. Uh, it's my sense. I don't mm -hmm. know. But, you know, he'd probably, you need to get, like we say, runs on the board, money in the bank. You know, you need to be able to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. invest some of that one-on-one -on -one time. And actually, you know, mm -hmm. thinking a little bit about who in the school environment can actually do that. You know, someone who can spend time and recess mm -hmm. time or 
um, you know, show some interest and really participate in with him, um, you know, that kind of building of the trust is probably one of the best, you know, interventions for a little boy like this. And having a network of that is ideally what we want, you know, like a few different relationships and a few, you know, across a few different settings, um, because that's what's going to help mm-hmm. the, the transitions kind of be easier too, because, you know, you can move your mind from what you're missing out on to kind of thinking about the next person and the things that are happening there and having some sense of safety with that. Um, so I just had another thought. Um, mm-hmm. Given the composition of the classroom, and I don't know because I'm not there and I don't know the teacher or whatever, but is there a period of time perhaps first up in the morning or in the middle session before lunch or whatever, where she would be okay with making it a much more structured section of the day? Or is all, is all of the day busy and, um, you know, wonderfully exciting and an event for which is fantastic i'm just wondering if mm. if there's a because it, it, it's really hard to get that in your head when you're an early childhood teacher and you're doing all this wonderful stuff all the time that if she made a conscious effort that there was an hour and a half of learning that was less busy more boring yeah more, you know, yeah. very, very, very routined um, because it would not, yeah, very yeah. predictable, mm. which would help every, all the other complexities in a class as well. It certainly wouldn't do them any harm. Mm. And the good, mm. the, the kids that, that um, cope with the classroom regardless will, will be fine. They will, they will, you know, benefit from it as well. Um, I just sometimes think, and again, I'm speaking from personal experience, that you need to make a conscious effort to do that when it's not part of your your um, natural daily practice. Mm. And I'm just thinking mm. that yeah. mm. if she could find it in her space <coughs> to do that, maybe she maybe it works in her program three days a week, or it might work best couple of mornings and one middle session or whatever um or the afternoon I mean when I had you one I used to find with little people who were similar um to James that if I did handwriting in the afternoon session (laughs) because it was so predictable and so structured and so teacher-driven without any thinking required, it was just do and follow and practice and model. Mm. Handwriting mm-hmm. last thing in the afternoon was a really good settling activity for my children similar to James. Now, that's just a personal mm-hmm. anecdote, but, yeah, I'm just wondering if she just, somebody brings it to her attention and she can just have a think about it and see if there is a space where she can um, mm. make a conscious effort to to um, put that in place, yeah. It may be helpful mm. to her, yeah. Mm. I know she's taken the suggestion from the deputy principal to the first lesson of the day was more of an exploring, going around the classroom, looking at certain things, like a free choice time. Mm-hmm. But now um, it's a maths activity straight up. They come in, they put their lunchbox in the fridge, they go and get a clipboard with today's maths problem, they sit down and they do it. Mm. Bang. So um, I'll see how that goes because that's just been that's just started the last two weeks. Mm. But the I thought that the maths problem was a bit too open ended and a bit too mm. unpredictable. Mm. No. <laughs> so okay. we'll we'll see how that goes. So she has she has made an effort, but yes. The you can make take um, make a lot of use of um, the handwriting as you said, and we have a textbook for grammar and mm. one for maths too. Oh, so okay. there are two opportunities for things that are you know straight out of a book, and you know you can differentiate for those kids that will finish in five seconds and yeah. you know give them more open ended and extra work you know to do. 
Yeah. But I'll, I'll put that to her. It's well, worth I a try. I, I think a useful way mm. to explain that too is about, you know, what does he sort of need to be able to do the maths? You know, what does he need to kind of learn before he can engage in those sort of activities? You know, a lot of the kids that come in and we say this in the program is we assume that they can calm themselves down. We assume that they feel safe. We assume a lot of things that a lot of these traumatized kids don't necessarily have. Um, yes, there might be mm-hmm. other different challenges, um, but if, if teaching him, you know, kind of recognizing, you know, teaching him how to kind of give himself a score out of 10 about how happy he's feeling or how stressed he's feeling before he comes in or, you know, teaching him, pre-teaching things about, you know, calming down or breathing or little strategies like that, that's the next level up, which is that supported regulation, we call it, where they actually practice this stuff. You know, that's going to buy this boy a lot of time to kind of be able to engage in some of the curriculum stuff. And in fact, it's going to buy Mm -hmm. her, you know, buy the teacher time to be able to manage this classroom a little bit better because you're kind of giving them the tools to not kind of present her with more challenges where she can actually do teaching and not just Mm -hmm. put out fires all the time. And then right up the top is self-regulation. So that's that, that's one way I think about differentiating. So, and um, Kai can comment on this as well. So, you know, if the kids are really dysregulated, your first option is, you know, stick with the predictable, boring routine, go from one thing to another. If they're still escalated, then, you know, go with the external kind of regulation, give them some time away within the classroom. Um, and then, you know, do the core regulation stuff, you know, check in with them to see how things are going. And then if they can kind of tolerate a lot of that stuff, then do the supported regulation stuff, which is, um, you know, them being a little bit upset, but they can still use some of the social emotional skills that you've taught them, you know, whatever it is that you're teaching through the day, um, some zone, you know, any of the strategies you're using. And then the final one, of course, is them being able to do that for themselves. So depending on where Mm. he's at, you know, if he's having a really tough day, you're not going to expect him to use his strategies to calm down. Or, you know, he might not even be responsive to anyone talking to him. He might just need some Mm -hmm. time or, you know, some, some, you know, and that way you can manage your demands of him and you can manage how you use the strategies and know how well they're going to work on that day. So it might be, you know, five steps back, you know, four steps forward or whatever it is. But at least you have Mm -hmm. a way to kind of think about, you know, where he's at and what he's capable of learning when it comes to those social emotional skills. Does that sort of make sense? Mm, uh, yes, I think because we assume, yeah. white middle class yeah, teachers yeah. assume that these kids will come to school with all these needs that we don't even think about because we yeah. have just been, we've dealt, you know, you know, we've been brought up. Yeah. And we can self-regulate, et cetera, and we expect yeah. that most kids can. But the kids we're getting now, yeah. we don't even know the words for the things that they can't do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, That's you right. know, all those, those. So we're just, we're learning with them as well, learning Absolutely. how to deal with and, them, how to and help you them. Know, if it's an, you know, if it's this, if it's an issue about kind of, empathy and things like that. I think it's, you know, really be having a partner for this teacher in just how challenging this classroom is. <laughs> just for someone to mm. talk about it. because when if she feels that she's supported, then she can really start to then think about James, think about, you know, that little scar on his lip and how that came to be and, and what he actually needs. And even though he's you know, seven, he's acting emotionally, he might only be at like a three or a four or even younger, you know, and mm-hmm. kind of free yeah. up some space to be able to think about that, I think. Um, and then, you know, I always start very, very small. Let's just try one small thing um, and see how we go. It's not that you're going to get a huge return on investment, you know, intervention with it, but it's just a small change to teach him what he needs for the rest of his life. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Do you have any thoughts um, just as we're finishing up? Um, no, I don't think so. I think um, yeah. I think it's wonderful that, you know, he's going to have that opportunity to, 
to explore his emotions one-on-one, -on -one, I think that's wonderful. And I mm. also think it's terrific that the resources have been put in there to support him having another yeah. extra body in the room. I mean, that that, mm. that in itself is an enormous um, helper of teacher stress to know mm. that you've got mm. somebody else in your space Ooh. with you. It's just wonderful. Mm. Even if, mm. even if the, everything goes pear-shaped, and you're, you're expecting it to do so, having another person in the room is, is a wonderful comfort that can be um, very disempowering yeah. and horrible feeling. So I think that that's wonderful. And that visual timetable, I think you will be able to, um, as you go down the track with his um, progress, identifying his emotions and things will be really um um, excellent to incorporate where he might have just a happy and a sad card that he flips over on his desk to demonstrate his feelings as he learns to identify those. I think those dovetailing his learning to, you know, describe his feelings with visual um, cards and things is wonderful because you'll be able to incorporate that and use it for him a scaffolding through all of his learning. Um, I think, mm. you know, I think that's great. Does the classroom have a visual timetable for everybody? They've, they've got one that the teacher writes on the whiteboard. It's not pictures, whereas his is images of of the textbooks that, he, that he's mm. going to use and, yep. mm. you know, his... His his bag and his lunchbox that goes mm. in the fridge. So this is very yeah. visual. Yeah, I was just thinking a classroom one would be perfect for the other little um, poppets in there mm, as well. The cherubs. Mm, <laughs> it would, but yeah. you know, again, yeah. that that would be something that, um, as an outsider, I would want to probably make for the teacher and hand them because it is quite an onerous task and it is another task to be mm. done. Um, but no, no, I think yeah. I think you're doing some really, really good stuff there, and I think that um, yeah, just just seeing if there could be there's that balance, like Gavin said, of if he's very dysregulated, that the teacher knows, okay, now is the time where I need to be really routined and boring, for one of another better description, mm. and just so that she then mm. regulates the activities according to his behaviour, which will suit everybody, but James's behaviour will be the driving force as to what happens <laughs> because mm. everybody else will be fine, you know. So, um, yeah, mm. I think, I think mm. that's just, just that one little raising her consciousness to say if he's like this, I think this activity would be the best thing to try. And for her, well, I think your deputy principal and you, yourself obviously are very supportive. I think sometimes we feel quite guilty as a classroom teacher that we're doing that and she needs to feel confident that she has permission to turn things around. Yeah. Mm. That's great. I feel like yep. um, it's such a case with so many layers, I think, but I hope I've given you a few things to be able to go off and try off Sue. Did you have any final thoughts or questions before we finish up? Um, oh, look, I've got heaps of questions, but they will take another hour. So <laughs> um, that's okay. No, this is, this is great, and I'll be excited to feedback to the teacher and our CESO as well, because she she does the like you said the visual timetable takes a lot of time and effort, and she's just really got that um, under in her routine. And she's written a, a booklet actually, rather than a social story for him, that's gone home to grandma. And there's one that stays okay. in the classroom that just talks about you know who's the boss at school and what your job is, James, and you know speaking with um, um, a kind voice or um, using the right words um, mm -hmm. and things like that. So you know, we've we've got her. She's um, you know uh, worth her weight in gold. Our CESO. Mm. So um, yes. Well, it'd be great to know how you go, and yeah. Um, yeah, just try one, even just one of those strategies, and then perhaps you know, in a month's time or a couple of months' time, we can 
touch base again and mm. and sort of do like a little bit of a progress chat and see how it's going. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's from the time I spoke to you in April to now, it's taken us a while to get where we are now. That you know, the teacher was away sick; she was very stressed with um, in this classroom oh, in this be. situation, and yeah. oh, she was. And you know, she's five years she's been teaching, but um, yeah, we were fearing that she might um, burn out very yeah. soon. But hopefully, we've supported her enough, and uh, we'll be able to get things on track. And so, yeah, another month's time, or well, we've got four weeks holiday coming up, and so probably in August. September, mm, I'll come back be great. and um, even, even email you and let you know how we're going. That would be terrific. That would be really good. Mm. We'd be happy to chat again. But thank you so much for your work. Thank you for your help with James. Um, and, yeah, hopefully we can touch base again in the future and have a chat. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for this opportunity. That was a teacher coaching call as part of our TIPBS program. If you would like to book in for a coaching call for yourself, visit www.tipbs.com and register your details. Thank you for listening. See you next time.